Welcome to E Partshala lecture series in computer science and this course is on operating systems and today we learn about interprocess communication, the need for uh, interprocess communication and the different issues in the design of mechanisms for interprocess communication. So, before getting into interprocess communication, we learn about two different operations that can be done on a process. So, a process has to be created as well as terminated. So, first we will see uh, about process creation. So, any process can create any number of children processes and the process that is creating is called the parent process and the ones that are created are the children processes. And to identify a process, there is a number called the process identifier or the PID. So, be it any kind of operating system, some identification is given for any process that has been created. And in the case of Unix, you can see all the processes uh, that have been created and that are currently up and running using the ps command. So, if you type ps command in the command prompt, you can see all the processes uh, that are currently present in the system. And say so when a parent process is creating children processes, the resources that are needed for the new, new processes that have been created can be shared from the parent or the new process can get a new set of resources. This depends on the design of the operating system. And similarly, the process can execute independently of the parent process or what can have happen is that for looking at the address space, the children process, children process can have a different address space than the parent process or they can share the same address space as that of the parent process. You have different uh, system calls in different operating systems for creating processes. In the case of Unix, you have the fork system call for creating a process. And when the fork system call is used for creating a process, a new process will be created which has the same text as that of the parent process. And the data and the stack initially will be shared by the child and the parent. And due course of time, say the child can be made to execute some other process or it can continue within uh, the address space of the parent process also. The exec system call uh, in the case of Unix is used after a fork generally to make the child process execute a different program because after a fork has been done, the child process will only execute the same as that of the parent process. But now if you want the child to do something else, then you can use this exec system call to make the child process execute something else. So now if you look at this diagram, you see that there is a process that is running and it does a fork and this fork creates a child process. Now there are two processes, the parent as well as the child process. The parent can wait till the child exits and the child process, it can either continue to uh, execute the same thing as that of the parent or it can use an exec system call to execute something else. And once the child finishes its process, its work, it will exit until then parent can wait. So once the child exits, the parent can go back continue to do whatever it wants to do after that. And now you can see a program written in C which is generally used in Unix, Linux kind of systems which is used for creating a new process. As we saw earlier, the system call for creating a new process is fork system call. So look at this, you have the main program, so this is the parent process and the parent process executes a fork system call and the fork system call at the end of the fork system call a new child process will be created. But 
there is one return value that goes to the parent process, another return value goes to the child process. The fork system call returns two different values, one to the parent and one to the child. To the parent, it will return the process ID of the child that has been created now and to the child it will return a value of 0. So now after this fork, after this particular line, there are two processes, the parent process as well as the child process. So when the child process executes, it will also start executing from this point in time or it will also execute from this line. When the parent is given the CPU, the parent will also execute from this line. That is because when the child has been created using this fork, the child gets a copy of the text of the parent process or the same instructions as that of the parent process. So since the parent was supposed to execute this line first, the child will also execute only this line. So now we have two processes, the child and the parent which will execute similar things. So when the child comes to this line, if PID less than 0, PID is the variable in which the return value of fork is stored. So in P, if PID is less than 0, it means it is a negative value. Generally in Unix based system calls, a negative value is got whenever that system call failed or when there was an error. So if this PID is negative, then it will print that fork had failed and it will exit. And now if PID equal to 0, so in the if the child is executing, the value of PID will be equal to 0 and it will execute this line exec LP bin ls ls null. What is this? Exec LP is a system call which is used to overlay the address space of the child process with whatever is given as the first argument. So here in the first argument, we are given the executable as bin ls that is the executable corresponding to ls command and this is the argument that you give to that and the other arguments are given as null. So now what happens? The child process will execute ls and it will print the output of ls to the output device. The parent process if it comes here, it will also again start in this point only and here it will check if it is negative, it is not negative, it is fine. So it will execute if PID equal to 0, but PID will not be equal to 0 for parent process. As I told you, fork returns the process ID of the child process to the parent process. So this loop will not be executed for the parent process and it will execute this else part. So what does the parent do? It now executes a wait. So the wait is actually for waiting for the child process to complete and then once the child exits, it will print this statement child complete and it will exit. And you, can, you need to understand here that see at this point after the fork has been done, there are two processes, the parent process and the newly created child process. And one of these two processes will be scheduled first or will be given the CPU first. Whoever gets the CPU first will run first. Suppose if the parent gets the CPU first, it will run first, it will come to this point and it will wait here because the child has not yet executed. Only when the child executes and finishes, it will come out of this wait call and print and exit. Suppose if the child had got the CPU earlier, then the child will execute and uh, the child will exit and the next time when this parent gets the CPU, it will not wait here because already the child would have exited and it will also exit. So this is a sample program that shows how a process can create another child process and the child process can do an exec and execute something else. And the other operation that you can do on a process is process termination. Process executes the last statement and it will ask the operating system 
to delete all details about it in the operating system. So, that is when this exit comes into picture. And uh, if it is a child process that is exiting, then it can give details about itself to the parent process which is waiting for the child to complete. Like say the parent process if it is waiting for a child to complete, then uh, the now the amount of time the child process had executed in kernel mode, the child process had executed in user mode etc. and so on, different accounting details about the child process will be present in the process table entry of the child process. All these details the parent process can collect and then the process table entry of the child process will be cleared off. So, that can be done. Whatever uh, resources have been allocated to a process that is currently exiting can be deallocated and be given back to the operating system. And suppose a parent exits, what will happen to the children of the parent? Okay. And that time there are different possibilities that can be done by an operating system and this also varies from operating systems to operating system. So, the parent exits, the parent had created a number of children, all the children are up and running now, what will happen to all these children? So, the children process can continue to execute even after the parent terminates. In that case, the children should be made the children of some other process which will take care of these children. The other possibility is the children are also terminated when the parent terminates. So, the parent terminates, its children should terminate before that and when these children terminate, these, these children had created other children, the other children also have to terminate and they can be a cascaded termination. So, now we have seen about two different operations that can be done on processes that is the process creation and process termination. Now, we will move on to learn about cooperating processes. So, you have a number of processes that can be present in a system and these processes uh, can either share data among themselves or may not share data among themselves. See if the processes share data among themselves, then they are called as cooperating processes. So, independent processes are nothing but processes which do not share data or anything among themselves, they execute independently. The execution of one process is not affected by the execution of the other process. But in the case of cooperating processes, because they share information among themselves, the execution of one process may affect the execution of the other process. So, why is process cooperation needed in a system, there are different uh, reasons for that. One is uh, information sharing, that is say one process needs to send some information to another process, then in that case there needs to be some communication among themselves or there needs to be some coordination among themselves. Uh, say for example, the output of one process has to be given as input to the other process then there needs to be some kind of communication. The other is computational speed up, that is you can split a particular job or a task into multiple tasks or multiple jobs and they can be split across different processes and these processes then can, can then communicate among themselves and can do the job together. Then the other pro reason is modularity. In any program that you design, you can have the program to be a modular program and each module can be assigned to a different process and each process can execute each module separately and then coordinate among themselves to get the final result. So, anyways, you need to have communication between different processes in the system. So, to learn about cooperating processes and to understand the need for cooperating processes, we will take up an example.
which is called the producer consumer problem. In this problem, there is one common buffer that is being shared by two processes. The two processes which are sharing are the producer process and the consumer process. The producer process places some information in the buffer and the consumer process has to remove that information from the buffer. So, these two processes are cooperating processes because they share that buffer which is common between both of them and one has to place and the other has to remove from the buffer and this buffer can again be defined or can be designed to be of infinite capacity or of bounded capacity. So, if it is an unbounded buffer, it places no limit on the size of the buffer, how as many items can be placed, there is no limitations on the size of the buffer or it can be a bounded buffer where there is limitations on the size of the buffer and you can place only so many items in the buffer. Say if the buffer can hold 10, only 10 can be placed in the buffer. So, now we look at this bounded buffer problem where you have a buffer of limited capacity and we will see how a producer and a consumer can use this bounded buffer to place and remove items. And to implement this bounded buffer uh, problem, a producer consumer problem using bounded buffer, the these uh, data are shared. So, you have an item which is defined as a structure and you have a buffer of size buffer size which is defined to be 10 which means this buffer can hold 10 items and you have two integer variables in and out which are initialized to 0 and these variables in and out and this buffer are and are all being shared by the producer process as well as the consumer process. Now uh, look at this you have a bounded circular buffer where you have say limited number of items can be placed because it is a bounded buffer. Say assume you have uh, 6 items can be placed in this buffer and there are 2 pointers as I told you you have the in pointer and the out pointer which are initially pointing all point to the same buffer first time. Now, when an item is placed into the buffer, so you place the item into the buffer and then you increase the in pointer. So, item is placed and you move the in pointer to the next location. So, the in pointer is removed from here and it is moved here and then when you place the next item, again the item is placed into this, the in pointer is moved to the next location and this is done by the producer. When the consumer is consuming, it will consume item from the out pointer, pointing location. So, when the consumer consumes this item, the out pointer is removed and it points to the next location from where items have to be consumed the next time. So, this is how we just keep moving. So, the in pointer can keep moving till it places item and when it exceeds the size of the buffer, then the in pointer will have to stop. And very similarly, when the in and out comes to the same location, the out pointer will have to stop, which means there is no element in the buffer. So, now look at this algorithm. So, this is the algorithm for the producer process. The producer process will check in, play if in plus 1 is a mod buffer size is equal to out ok. So, this is a because this is a circular buffer you cannot exceed the buffer size and you put it as a modular operator because uh, you can go around and place items in a circular fashion ok. And uh, 
if n plus 1 mod buffer size is equal to out, it means that the buffer is full and you cannot place items into that. Else, you can put the item into the buffer into the, in the location that is pointed to by in as I had shown you in the diagram. And after placing the item into the buffer, which is the location pointed by in, you increment the pointer by 1 mod buffer size, okay, so that it goes to the next free location. So, when in plus 1 mod buffer size is equal to out, the buffer is full, you cannot place items into the buffer, else you place information into the buffer pointed by the location by in. And if you look at the consumer's code, the consumer checks if in is equal to out. In will be equal to out when the buffer is empty. Then in that case, the consumer will keep quiet. It can do nothing. But the other, if it is not that case, then it will try to consume or take the item from the location which is pointed to by buffer. Okay, after consuming the item uh, from the buffer pointed to by the out pointer, then it will increment the out pointer by 1 modular bu modulus by buffer size because it is a circular kind of a buffer. So, initially it checks if in is equal to out, if it is in is equal to out then the buffer is empty, else it can consume items from the buffer, this consumer process. So, here we see that the in pointer, the out pointer and the buffer are all shared variables or shared memory between the producer process and the consumer process. So, they can result in problems when both of them try to access the, uh, the variables and the buffer simultaneously in the sense like if it is halfway it is in dangling state and so on. So, then in that case you need to have some kind of synchronization between the two processes that are running. So, these two processes here we see that the producer process and the consumer process are cooperating processes because they share some information between them. A cooperating processes, if they do not share common memory, then how do they communicate? Then that is by means of different mechanisms that the operating systems provide called inter-process communication facilities. So, the operating system provides different mechanisms for processes to communicate and to synchronize their actions. So, in this IPC mechanism, there is no need for sharing of address space. You can have a message passing kind of system where processes will send information or messages to one another without having a common shared memory. So, for IPC using this message passing system, generally all mechanisms provide with two different operations, one is the send operation and the other is the received operation. So, in send operation you say send this particular message and receive you say receive this particular message and the message size in both the cases can either be fixed a standard message fixed size or it can be a variable size. So, when two processes P and Q want to communicate between themselves, they need to first establish a communication link between them and then they should exchange the messages via send and receive operations. And this implementation of the communication link between the two processes can either be physical or it can have logical properties as well. Physical in the sense there needs to be a common shared bus or there needs to be a wire between the two uh, machines, a cable can, or it can be a shared memory or anything like that or it can have logical properties. So, here we discuss only about the logical properties of an IPC mechanism. So, for discussing about the properties of an IPC mechanism, we need to look at different questions which needs to be addressed. So, one is two processes need to communicate, how do you establish a link between them? And when there is a link, can a link be associated with 
only two processes or with more than two processes. And when there are two processes that communicate, how many links do you need for communication between the two processes? Is just one link enough or you can have multiple links between the two processes? And when you design a link, what can be the capacity of a link? And is the size of the message that you are trying to send over the link be fixed or variable? And can the link be unidirectional or bidirectional? All these issues have to be looked at. And for communication between two processes, you can either have a direct kind of communication or an indirect kind of communication. Indirect communication you have say messages like this, you have send and receive operations like this where you say send to this process P this particular message or specifically you say receive from this process Q this particular message. And in this kind of direct communication, if you look at the properties of a communication link, a link will be established automatically and a link is associated with exactly one pair of communicating processes. So, if there are A and B, between A and B there is only one link and between A and B there is there will be certainly a link and between, B, between A and B there will be one link. These are the properties of this kind of communication and the link can be unidirectional or bidirectional. And in the case of indirect communication, you will have something called a message box or a mail box that sits in between the two processes for communication and information will be transferred to this mailbox and from there uh, uh, receiving will be happening. So, this mailbox will have a unique ID and only if two processes have a common shared mailbox they can communicate between themselves. So, in this case in this indirect communication the communication link will have properties like there will be a link established only if the processes share a common mailbox and a link can be associated with many processes that is you can have a mailbox which can be used by many processes not only two processes. And each pair of processes may share several communication links that is between two processes there can be many mailboxes. And the link can be unidirectional or bidirectional. And if you look at this kind of communication, you need to have to create a new mailbox, you may have to send and receive messages through the mailbox, you may have to destroy a mailbox. These will be the operations that need to be done on the mailbox or the link. And for sending and receiving messages, in the early case in direct communication, you try to send to a particular process a particular message, but here you send to a mailbox a message and very similarly receive from A the mailbox the message. And now suppose look at this example, you have process P1, P2 and P3 which share a common mailbox A and P1 is sending and it goes to this mailbox A, who will receive? Will it be P2 or P3? who will get the message. So, this kind of problem comes when the link or the mailbox is shared between multiple processes. So, for that different solutions can be given, one is a link can be associated with at most only two processes, only two processes can have a common link or a common mailbox or it, they can be a common mailbox for different processes, but only one process can execute the receive operation or the system should decide on who should be the receiver. And the other issue that needs to be looked at here is synchronization. So, when we have message passing systems, uh, you can have either blocking or non-blocking kind of senders and receivers. Blocking senders are also called synchronous, synchronous and blocking sender, the sender will be blocked till the message is received. So, when sender sends a message, the receiver has not yet received the message means the sender will be blocked till the receiver receives the message. And very similarly in the receiving side, in blocking receive, 
receiver will be blocked or receiver will be waiting till the message it is supposed to receive is available. And in non-blocking kind of sending and receiving, the sender will send a message, it will not wait for the receiver to receive, it will just continue, it is other work. In non-blocking receive, the receiver will either receive a valid message or it will receive nothing, it will not wait for something to be available to receive. So, different cases can be possible with different kind of mechanisms can have blocking as well as non-blocking sending and receiving operations. And the other issue that you need to address here is that buffering or the capacity of the link. The capacity of the link can be assumed to be of zero capacity. That is, you cannot place anything in the link. The sender must wait for the receiver. And you can have a bounded capacity. That is, you can place a limited or finite number of messages into the link or it can assume to be of infinite capacity where you can have infinite length messages or as many messages can be placed into the buffer. So, here we have learnt about we have seen about different characteristics of interprocess communication mechanisms like synchronization, buffering, the way in which is named etc and so on. So, today in this class we learnt about how processes can be created, how they can execute something else and how processes can be terminated. And then we learnt about cooperating processes, how cooperating processes share common variables and how two processes can communicate using an interprocess communication mechanism. And we learnt about different issues that need to be looked at while implementing an IPC or interprocess communication mechanism. Thank you.